This is a Commodore 64 board. And this is an exact modern replica. My mission, should I choose to accept it, is to get it working just like the original Commodore 64. Hello and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. This is a replica board of a Commodore 64 board made by Rob Taylor. All computer boards aren't made anymore, so little by little they are becoming a scarce resource. So really, it's great to have someone today taking the time to replicate and make those boards. Damien, one of my viewers in Spain, bought this board, ordered all the components, built it, and nothing. It didn't work. And since he didn't have the right tools to diagnose it, he sent it to me to fix it. So this should be interesting, because we're not just tracking down a component that stopped working like in a typical fix, but really it could be anything since this board was never working to begin with. It could be a bad solder joint, something that was placed incorrectly, or even a wrong component. Hopefully this should be interesting to those of you building your own kits, as well as those of you repairing your own computers. So having said that, let's get into it. All right, so here we have this absolutely gorgeous board. And the first thing that we're going to do is measure voltages. I'm not going to try to get any video image. I mean, I know it's not working, supposedly, but I want to make sure that we're getting the right voltages, especially out of the voltage regulators. Before we get started, I just wanted to thank this episode's sponsors, PCBWay. With PCBWays, you can make your own PCBs for your own projects or for even open source projects. If you're interested in that, go over to PCBWay.com and check them out. I highly recommend them. So this one should have the input. Yep, 10, 11, perfect. That's ground. And this should be five volts. So oh. that's three volts and dropping. There's a huge short. I better stop it right now. There is something. Yeah, I can tell that it's getting hot. So something is probably drawing a lot of current from the five volt rail and it's just causing this to overheat and drop the voltage. Wow, and that was on for just a few seconds. I didn't notice that anything super, super hot. And I believe the five volts in here are only going to the VIC two chip. And I don't know if they're going to the SID. I need to check the schematics, but the SID is not even connected. So it should just be going here. As far as I can tell from the schematics, the 5 volts generated by that voltage regulator just goes to the VIC chip, not the set like I was thinking originally. They did it a way to minimize noise from other parts of the system affecting the image and causing any kind of interference. So there aren't many things that could be going wrong in there. So let's just remove the VIC chip completely and see if that's still happening. Hopefully it's not a problem with the VIC chip. And let's measure that again. 2.9 and drop in. We start even lower. What is going on? Is there something incorrectly set up in the circuit that you know brings the voltages over to here? I should check this one really quickly. I need to do it quickly because this can be on for a long time. Yeah, that's fine. That's putting out 12 volts. But yeah, it really worries me how quickly the voltages drop in here. And this is not so hot. I mean, this is just warm right now. So there is something, but the input, let me double check the input again. Yeah, the input is rock solid. But that is dropping, 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 dropping. Okay. So this is very odd because as far as I can see, the only place that these five volts are going is to the VIC2 chip. Without the VIC chip there, this shouldn't be drawing any current. So I wonder if this is just a defective voltage regulator. Um, don't have a good explanation otherwise. One thing I can do is just remove this leg. So it's really not connected to anything else in the board. And if it's getting hot, then it's for sure that. Although sometimes just getting a leg out might be difficult. Maybe easier just to put another one completely. It just fell through. I love it when that happens. <laughs> and here you have another one that is completely identical. So let's measure voltages again. Interesting that it's a little higher than the other one. 
And so far it's not dropping. Oh, boom, it just went down. Okay, so it wasn't that. There is something else somewhere that is making that drop. So I put the original voltage regulator back and the heat sink in place. And while I was looking over the schematics, I noticed one more thing. This chip over here that takes care of doing the clock signal generation from the oscillator also uses the five volts generated by this voltage regulator. So we should remove it and see if that makes any difference. Okay, let's see. We may have found the problem. Oh, no, we didn't. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's something else. Clearly, there has to be something else connected to this. I just need to figure out what it is. I looked over the schematics to see if there was anything else connected to this 5 volt rail, and I couldn't find anything. So, really, this is connected to this inductor, a couple capacitors to hold the 5 voltage up, and that's it. So, if really that's it, one of those elements is bad. So I started looking a little bit more closely and I don't see anything wrong, I don't see anything wrong. And then I noticed this one is kind of, this capacitor is kind of bulging a little bit and I look a little more closely and it's, this is not a regular ceramic capacitor, it's a tantalum capacitor and those are polarized. And guess where the plus is? This one, and guess where it's supposed to be? Right there. So probably what was happening is if after a couple of seconds of applying that voltage, it was just starting to short. Lucky us, it didn't blow up or anything. So let's flip it and I'm willing to bet that's gonna fix it. Okay, so this is going back in and I need to put the plus there, okay. First of all, tantalum capacitors are usually blue, which is why it took me so long to find this one, camouflage of the same yellow color as the ceramic capacitors in this build. And what's different about a tantalum capacitor? Internally, they're quite different, but other than the fact that they're polarized, they seem quite similar to ceramic capacitors. Especially in this case, which just seems to serve as a decoupling capacitor, I have no idea why the original designers chose tantalum over a ceramic one. It's not even marked as polarized in the original schematics. If anyone knows, please let me know. Some of you have a lot of experience with that kind of board design, and I'd love to know the reasoning behind this particular design. I didn't see any other tantalum capacitors on the board, so let's test that one again. So we start with 4.9, like before, and will this last more than a few seconds? It's looking promising, but I've said that before, and then it went down, so... No, I think this is going to hold now. Yep, this is holding. Okay, so we definitely found one problem so far. Now that we got some stable voltages, it was time to check for the clock signals into the VIG-2 and whether it generated any video signal. Okay, so first thing, let's check the in clock signal into the VIG-2. And that's in pin 22. And that looks good. Yep, I see there 7.8 megahertz. That's right. And the output signal is in this pin. And that's almost a megahertz, 985 kilohertz. I think that's correct because this is a PAL board and the CPU runs at a slightly different frequency than the NTSC one. On pin 21, there's also a clock signal generated by the VIG-2. It's the color clock signal, which I think is used for the color encoding. That's a much higher frequency one. So yeah, 17 megahertz looks about right. So yeah, all of that looks just fine. So this is the luminance signal, supposedly. And it's just very weird that this is ground. I mean, there aren't, there aren't even any ripples or anything. And then the chrome signal Interesting. So that, so that might be the color burst that we're seeing right there because we're at eight microseconds and that's eight squares. So they're spaced 64 microseconds away. So that's correct. This is generated at the beginning of each raster line. One thing that is different about this revision of the board from other revisions is that the luminance signal generated by the VIG chip is always sent to the RF modulator. Some processing happens there, 
and then it generates the composite video signal that goes out to the video connector. On other boards, that kind of processing happens outside. So we see the resistors and capacitors and some transistors, and the RF modulator is completely optional. But here you need to have it. And what we have here is not a regular RF modulator. This is a special replacement by Edu Arana that generates composite and audio out as, a, as separate outputs just to eliminate one source of potential confusion because I've never used this. I'm going to desolder it. It's just a few pins right there. Now that the RF modulator or the replacement is out, let's compare the signals because these signals now should not be connected to anything. So this should be luminance and yep, we're still at ground and this should be chrome. So this is floating around 10 volts. That seems really wrong. Since I think we need to have this circuit in place to be able to see any meaningful signals out of the VIC2, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix this. So indeed, there was something not right about this. It says this here that because of the different types of Commodore 64 boards, some of them will have 5 volts coming to this pin, and some of them will have something else. In this case, we had 12 volts. Hopefully, it didn't blow up anything. Um, hopefully, it was prepared for that. But what we need to do is just desolder that pin completely so it doesn't make contact and then hook up uh, 5 volts somewhere on the board. Okay, the RF modulator replacement is in without that voltage connection. So I'm just going to hook up a cable and I'm going to use the 5 volt from the graphic circuit, the one generated by this particular voltage regulator just because it's going to be more noise free. And since this is a image generating part, I want it to be, you know, it's probably good to have as little noise as possible. And because this uses modern electronics, I think it probably will make a lot less noise than other parts of the circuit. If that doesn't work, we'll can hook up to five volts anywhere else. Okay, once again, let's check the luminance signal, see if there's any changes. Oh, there you go, that looks like a totally valid luminance signal for the whole frame. There's nothing in it, so this is just a black screen right now, but that looks that looks right. And what about the chrome signal? Okay, that's like before, which is getting probably the color burst. So, okay, this is much more encouraging. Now it could be something completely unrelated that is just generating a black screen. There was no point in trying to use any diagnostic software until we had the correct voltages and we had some kind of video signal. So now it's finally time to break out the diagnostics cartridge and let's see if it helps us find the source of that black screen. So time to try some diagnostics. I'll set this up for dead test cartridge. Set one and I'm plugged in and let's see it. And it looks like we still get a blank screen. We have a signal. We saw that in the oscilloscope. The TV recognizes that. But we're getting no image at all on the screen. This is probably not necessarily going to help, but it's not going to hurt at all. Is I'm going to remove some of the chips that are non-essential for the dead test cartridge. So I'm going to remove the CIAs. I'm going to remove the ROM. And obviously, need PLA, need CPU, need VIC chip, and the clock signal. And I probably need most of those. So for now, just remove those. I just realized that, of course, we can remove the RAM as well, as long as we're testing with one of those diagnostics programs. And yes, this is the kind of board that only has two chips for the RAM. These are 41464. So I believe that each of them has 64K times 4 bits each. So the two together make 64 kilobytes. So let's try without the RAM. Oh, oh, it's flashing. So that's actually really good. It, that means that we are definitely executing a program from the cartridge and that it's detecting that the RAM is completely faulty. So it's not even attempting to display anything on the screen. So the question is, why are we getting that now, but before we're getting nothing on the screen at all?
So just in case, I'm going to try some DRAM from my box of DRAM. And yeah, here I have 41464s. These are used in the um, Spectrum Plus 2, in the Amstrad Plus. And let's try it again. Oh, wow. There you go. It seems to be working correctly, the dead test cartridge. Image looks good. Seems that it's passing the memory. So I guess the previous RAM chips were faulty, but it wasn't reporting them as faulty. That's very annoying. Now it's doing the sound test. We're not hearing anything, but obviously we don't have the SID chip in place, so that's totally fine. Unfortunately, what we just saw is not totally uncommon. The dead disk cartridge, as useful as it is, sometimes it really misreports RAM problems. Sometimes it doesn't indicate that the RAM is faulty like it just did, and sometimes it flashes a certain number of times to indicate that a particular RAM IC is faulty and it's completely incorrect. So it's something to keep in mind, but at least we got it sorted this time. So I put back all the ICs and removed the test cartridge, and let's see if we get the basic prompt or if we have some other problems. There we go. Beautiful. That's great. I'm, I'm super happy with this. So one last thing. Let's try the regular diagnostics, not the dead test cartridge. So it'll be there. Okay, everything plugged in, including one of my own SID chips, just to test this. And let's give it one final test. Interesting. So, bad CIAs and bad cassette port. What's that about? Okay, I just swapped out the two CIAs for two that I know are working from my blue C64. And let's see what happens. Wow, so it marks them as bad as well. So I don't believe it's the CIAs. I think there's something on the board that is making the CIAs not behave correctly. The board at this point seems to be working perfectly fine, except for those odd CIA errors. The problem is deeper and longer than you'd think from such seemingly unimportant error message, but it will take us on a journey involving analog signals, trigger levels, and disreputable Chinese chip factories. But that will have to wait until next time. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.